All right. Well, good morning, River Tree. It is awesome getting to worship with you today, and I want to introduce you to my friend Brian. Brian is a candidate that's here this weekend with his wife, Jen, to see about maybe being the lead pastor of this church. So can we say hi to Brian? And I just want to say, uh, I, was, I was feeling this really strongly as we were singing, but I just want to say that I love this church so much, and God has put that love in my heart for you. Um, and for uh, all of River Tree, and what I've learned about uh, Brian and Jen this last couple of days is one that they can handle a lot of meetings. I know that. A we lot. put them through the ringer. But it is an amazing thing when you meet someone that is really gifted. Brian's a gifted teacher and, and leader. But when you meet people that really love God's church, it is an amazing gift. And just thank you for loving the church, Brian. Thank I just you. love that about you. So uh, I'm going to pray and get out of the way. And Brian, I, we asked Brian to jump right into our Built series and share with us a word that blesses the church today. And so I'm going to pray for him and uh, step off the stage. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much that you love us with a love that we can't even comprehend. And I just thank you that you've poured that love into Brian's heart through your Holy Spirit, and it's very obvious. So, Lord, we just ask right now that you would fill him with your Holy Spirit and that the words that come out of his mouth would be all you. And, Lord, right now as a church, we open up our minds to be renewed. We open up our hearts to be purified by you. And, Jesus, we want to just thank you for loving us. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to respond by loving one another today a little more. So Lord, we just give you this time in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. I know you guys know this, and I hope you hear that this does not come like a cliche. Y'all have, sorry, I said y'all, forgive me. Uh, you guys have amazing leaders. Do you know that, right? And I mean amazing leaders. It's been so awesome learning from your pastor. My wife and I are actually from Chicago and Michigan. We've only been pastoring in the South for a little bit, so I promise that y'all will disappear in just a matter of minutes. It's the real thing. I want to introduce you to my wife, and the reason I married her, you're about to see. All blonde, all six foot, all legs, and she's an amazing, amazing Christ follower and a teacher of God's Word. Unfortunately, you've got me today and not her. Lights out. This is my wife, Jen. Good morning. We're just so excited to be with all of you, and I will probably say y'all as well, it does roll off the tongue a little sweeter than you guys lately, but um, I want to introduce you to our family. Our kids are all down in Tennessee. Um, we begged them not to make the nine-hour drive. Some of the college ones almost did, but we convinced them not to because they're crazy. That's all four of them right there, Nadia, Amaya, Caleb, and Micah. Um, our oldest one is Amaya. She is married to um, an answered prayer. Those of you praying for your kids as spouses, he is a testimony to what happens when you pray. He is an incredible man of God and leader of his home, and they gave us a grand dog this year. And uh, we've That's all we got them. so far, but we are praying for grandchildren, but we've got a grand yes. dog. So. so we have also our Micah. He is our second born. He is the life of the family, the party at the dinner table. You never know what he's going to say, and it, you're, he keeps you laughing until you're crying. Avi, this is him at his sister's wedding ready to go. So <laughs> our third born is our Caleb. Um, he is our math genius. This is him, a picture for his fraternity. It is a Christian university, so we're praying that's a holy sign coming from his hand. We don't really know. We don't know its meaning, but we're trusting it's, that it's deep, okay. You know, it's total secret. So, <laughs> And then finally, our cherry on top, and that is our baby Nadia. That is our that is one that makes him a I puddle of mush. I can't look. And um, I cannot she is look. just an amazing woman of God, mm. our, our lawyer in training. It's what happens when you have three older siblings and you find every weakness and every argument for 18 years of your life. So we're so excited to meet you all, and I can't wait to shake everybody's hand after. Yeah, thank you, Jen. Our kids love Jesus. That is the only thing we got right. So as, uh, as Jason said, um, I, don't, I don't have a candidating message. I'm not one of those people. Um, like, you know, there's, there's these special candidating messages, and I just am a teacher of God's Word. Is that Okay. So I had a message. They said, hey, preach what you want. So I had it ready. And then John called me and he said, hey, if you would, can you kind of keep it within Matthew 5, 6, and 7? So I was like, yeah, John, sure. That's no problem whatsoever. But what he didn't know is that I've said for 25 years of ministry the following phrase. I've never deviated. 
If I could only have three chapters of the Bible, and that was all I was allowed to read, it would be Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Jesus' first sermon. Because on it, we build the foundation of our life, right? And if you've started studying it as you have, and you've probably read it many times, it is a difficult three chapters. One of the simplest to read, 27 unique teachings that are just about pulling teeth to do. At least they are for me. So we're going to dive into one of those right now that the Holy Spirit led me to. I want you to open your Bible to Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. We're going to read through verse 26. Before we do that, I want you to realize that this is one of six, one of six unique teachings. It extends all the way to verse 48. They're unique because Jesus says the exact same phrase six times. You have heard it was said, but I tell you. He's referring to Moses the giver of the law, who was speaking to Israel. So different giver, different audience. Now he's saying, I tell you. He's not doing away with what Moses said. You're going to see that in a moment. But that is the introduction. You heard Moses say this. That's good. But I'm going to tell you something deeper. I'm going to draw your heart to a deeper element of the law. And that's what we're going to dive into. So let's do it together. Reading from the NIV, I'm going to stop a couple times, talk about some unique things. Let's take a look at it together. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. What? This guy's talking about murder? Hold on. But anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. And he goes on, but I tell you, there's the phrase, that anyone who is even angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, circle the word again if you're taking notes. Anyone who says to her brother or sister, Raka, which if they were saying it, it would be Raka for as long as you can do it. By the way, a lot of translations translate that as fool. It's a hard word to translate because it was a much bigger concept than our simple English language can do. I had a Jewish professor that lived there his entire life, and he said, Brian, Raka was on the border of cussing in someone's face. The NASB actually says that this, you're, you good for nothing, fill in your favorite expletive. It was a rough thing to say. And then he says one more thing, and if any one of you says, you fool, you'll be in danger of the fire of hell. Before we move on from that, many times there's a mistake made that there's three different teachings that Jesus is saying there. That's not present, actually, in the Greek. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi in addition to being king and lord, and he taught the way all Jewish rabbis do. He's talking about one thing, but he's intensifying it three times. We'll get to that one thing in just a moment. Let's go on. What do you do about this? So he says, therefore, if any of you are offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, circle that, go and be reconciled to them, and then Come and offer your gift. He gives us one more little piece. Let's look at it. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still on the way together. Or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown in prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you've paid the last penny. I'm going to do one more thing that I do and have done for 25 years of ministry, I'm gonna pray for us, but it's mostly gonna be about me because I don't want to leave here the same way that I came. I really believe that God's word changes us and I don't preach unless it's wrecking me and this message I'm about to share is wrecking me. So if you see me at the altar later, it's because I need it. And I pray that you always have that your whole life. Every time you hear the word, listen to it, you say, God, I don't want to leave. If we, if we want to leave the same way that we came, then why come? Like, isn't the word to change us? Yeah. Pray with me. Would you do that? God, I thank you for your word. This word, spoken by your son Jesus in his very first sermon when he was 30 years old on this earth. And these three chapters are amazing. As we take a look at this one piece of the 27, as we take a look at this one piece of the, 20, of the six that are similar, I pray that you would penetrate our hearts. God, start with me. Holy Spirit, please. I want to be changed by your word. I don't want to be a hearer. I want to be a doer, God. I really do. I want to be different when I leave, and I pray that we would all have that heart in your name. Amen. 
You ready? I'm going to show you one more picture of my family because it's connected to this. My wife and I are now empty nesters, so life is great. Our dates now consist of, hey, you want to take a trip to Florida? A couple, you know, weekends. So we were going to Florida just a couple years ago, and we were sent this by our kids. They were all together, and they were at a restaurant eating, and my wife and I, we were like, oh, yes, our kids love each other. Do this. They want to do this. They're spending time together. And so we get on the plane, and we're just super happy about it. We land an hour and a half later, and our phones have blown up with texts of lividness, anger, and hate between one another. 21 minutes after this picture was taken, they got into the largest argument they have been in in 18 years. That's facts, yes? Blow up World War III. It was bad. It was mom and dad you need to speak to them. I'm not even mentioning their name. You know who I'm talking about. I'm sick and tired of it. I'm not dealing with it. I call them this. I'm sorry. I ask for forgiveness, but they are this, and you need to tell them that, and I'm not speaking to them again for a week. It was straight up hell, and they just were eating together. Like, this is love, yes? And 20 minutes later, and of course, they, it was over something stupid. It was just different perspectives about an issue. Nothing you and I ever do. And it was hate. I'm not going to lie. It was hate. Now, my wife reminded me about 10 minutes ago in worship, she said, you never told the first service that they actually now do love each other. So I'm going to say something now. They actually do now love each other. So they got over it. Uh, But it took some time. Why is that important? Because hate and anger enters our hearts far easier than we desire. So I want to give you some background on this text. I said it was one of six. Six different teachings. This one is about murder and hate. The next one's about adultery. Then it's about lying. Then it's about, oh, and it goes on to forgiveness. And he says the same thing. Moses said this. It's good. But I tell you this. What Jesus is doing is he's drawing them to the perfect original intention behind the law. So for example, the third one is about divorce, and he says, you know that Moses said that give your wife a certificate of divorce. And actually in the Old Testament, there were lots of reasons they could do divorce, all kinds, because God knew that their heart was going to be sinful and they were going to make mistakes. And he said, but I tell you, don't do it except for one exception, right? Marital unfaithfulness. And he goes on to give another example, adultery. You heard it was said, don't commit adultery, but I tell you, don't even lust. Well, isn't that what Moses meant in the beginning? It actually was. Don't you remember in the Ten Commandments, we don't covet a neighbor's spouse? Jesus is returning the nation of Israel, his disciples, and saying, look, thousands of years ago, you heard the law, but I'm telling you, there was something purer behind that law And this is what I'm telling you. Jesus is saying it's deeper than you think. So in another study, you can look at the other five. We're just looking at this first one that started in verse number 21. This is a game changer this morning. I believe in your home. (laughs) It was clearly needed in my home. In your workplace, where you work out, where you play, where you eat our third spaces. This is a game changer, so just press your heart in to what the Spirit might say to you this morning. In verse number 21 and 22, I talked about it earlier, it's, it's not really a proper interpretation with the original Greek to say, well, you know, calling them a fool and being angry, there are all these three different teachings. No, Jesus is simply progressively saying to us, the reason that you were told not to murder is because although you would never think of doing that, most people, Go back to Cain and Abel, the very first murder. Cain didn't wake up and say, you're dead. I'm just going to kill him. Don't even know what actually murder is, but I'm going to do it. No. What happened? You know the story. They offered to the Lord sacrifices. And because Cain's was something he could afford to do, but it was good, God accepted it. But with Abel, it was something much, much richer and much deeper. And what happened to Cain? He saw what Jesus, or what the Father did, And he backed away, and he's like, I don't understand. I gave you an offering. He gave you an offering. You don't like my offering as much as his offering. And what began? Anger, right? 
But the problem is anger always leads to resentment, and resentment always leads to bitterness, and bitterness always leads to strife, and then that's when the wheels can come off, right? So what did we just read? Don't even be angry because I know what it can lead to. Anger can lead to sin quite easily. Do you remember when Jesus was angry? Pastor, he was never angry. When he flipped the tables in the temple, I promise he didn't have a smile on his face. He was angry, but it wasn't to the point of sin. I think we all know this principle extremely well, but Ephesians chapter 4, Paul repeats the same teaching and says, in your anger, don't sin. There's going to be anger, but when it leads to hate, he says, don't let the sun go down in your anger. So Jesus is teaching his disciples, this is what Moses said, don't murder, but I'm telling you, you have to avoid even being angry at your brother or going further and saying, or aka to your brother, you good for nothing. Don't do it. Why? Because once that little seed enters in, well, we just saw an example with Cain and Abel of what can happen. Pastor, that would never happen with me. Sure, I'm ticked off with them, but they're jerks and they don't agree with me. Can I just share a principle that I think is so important here? It's so critical that the followers of Jesus love one another. And I'm going to tell you why when I talk about my kids. If you say to Jen and I after service, Pastor Brian, wow, Jen's new pink pants, wow, you guys are amazing, I love you, hate your kids, love you, you can't love me and hate my kids, right? I can't do that with you. How much more with our Heavenly Father? God, I love you, hate them, love you, God, though. God, you don't, I mean, I love you, you don't understand my crazy mother-in-law, but I love you. Well, God loves your crazy mother-in-law. By the way, if you happen to be a crazy mother-in-law in here, I'm not, I'm not talking to you, it's just a story. Think about that for a second. Why is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, saying murder is one thing, it's already in the Ten Commandments, but I'm telling you, just don't even let the anger get in your heart. Can I just be honest with you? This is one of the hard teachings. This is one of the 27 ridiculously difficult concepts in these three chapters in his first sermon, because we can all say, praise God, amen, where's the communion? We can all say that. But to live that out, that I'm not going to be angry when it's so easy for it to enter my heart, it is for me. Look, I, I need to just put this out there. I'm, one of the things that my wife and I are is we're not pretenders and we're not fake and I run to purple elephants. I just, I just, let's just talk truth. Can we do it for a second? It would be lost on me and it would be lost on you if you and I did not recognize that right now this week, half of this country is seeing red and is so angry and so scared and so terrified, right? Half of this country that's not okay. And of course, we know in division, and we understand that. And you might be saying, well, yeah, but well, it's not a political. I, wherever you're at, you're at. But wherever I'm at, I'm at. It's not a political message. My point is, do you know how much anger is flowing right now? Do you know how much hate is flowing right now? And maybe, maybe you're on the side that's happy. 50% of the, the country is super happy right now. And you're probably thinking, you know, I, they need to get over it. Like, life moves on. You're right. But, like, do you realize that if it just would have changed by 5 million votes, you would be sitting here right now seeing, right, you probably wouldn't even be in the building right now. Isn't that amazing? So it's not lost on me that if there was ever a week in the last four years or the next four that we can say, wow, this is important, it's this. Yeah, but, Pastor, isn't there right and wrong? Of course there is. Pastor Brian, isn't there like policy that's true and not true? And opinion? Sure, all that's true. But how can we say we love the world and we want to reach the world, but I hate the people that disagree with me? Right? Let me, I'm going to just make it super real. It's hard for me to worship. One of the challenges that I have when I worship and I sing the word Lord is I don't like singing the word Lord because I really want him to be my Lord. But when I think about things I haven't surrendered to him yet, He's actually not my Lord, is he? I haven't given that over. So I, I like take worship really serious. So it, I wonder if in heaven it looks like this. Like here's Pastor Brian. God, I love you. And you know what? I'm just going to start singing because you're going to love it. God, I love you. And I think you're amazing. And I want you in my life. And I hate your guts, Jesus. 
God, I want you to be Lord of my life, and you are amazing, but I can't stand them. Hallelujah. God, I want you to have all of me, and I want all of you, but please make my neighbors move away. It is really good that I'm not interviewing for the worship team, yeah? Like, that's a good thing. How ridiculous is that? But can I just tell you, when anger's in our heart for our brother or sister, Jesus is right. He's right. Of course he's right. It's truth. But I'm just, it's right. Like, how does that sound? I love you. I hate them. Well, pastor, I don't hate them. I mean, I'm livid and angry and think what they think is stupid. You don't understand my mother-in-law, or you don't understand my boss. Forget politics. It's just an example. You don't understand what that person did to me. You're right, I don't. But as long as we have anger in our heart, it is super hard for us to be the hands and feet of Jesus, right? I want you to think about that as we move to what he says to do about it. So in verse 23, he says, if you realize that you've got anger in your heart, or (laughs) this one's crazy, if you know that they have anger in their heart toward you, stop what you're doing and be reconciled. Can we just sit on that for a moment? What is it that he said stop doing? He said stop worshiping. Jesus was talking about the altar. He's talking about the sacrifices. He hadn't died yet. The sacrificial system was still going on. They still sang in the courts and read from the Torah. He's saying, stop doing that. Stop your communion right where you're at because if you've got anger in your heart, you have to deal with that. You've got to be reconciled. Stop the worship. Stop, like, you can't do that. That's unbelievable that he says that because we separate our anger and we separate our, our hurt and we say, well, but I love God, and I'm, I'm, I'm in church, but yeah, that, that's, just, that's just a different issue. When it comes to the kingdom of God, there is no different issues, right? They all come under his lordship. He says, stop what you're doing and make it right. Now, I want to tell you something. You are not going to find anywhere in Scripture the following concept anywhere. And you must become best friends again. They're not going to find it. That person that hurt you, you can go all the way through this. I've done it dozens of times. You will never find, forgive them and become best friends again. Or forgive them and it's all going to be perfect and there will be no bad memories. You are never going to find that. Now, have I seen that happen? Have I seen people be restored and incredible evil that took place and now there's a friendship? Yes, but that's not common, just be honest. So that's not what is being asked of you and I. Nor is it being asked that You have to pursue reconciliation and it's going to work. We are called to reconcile. In fact, Paul talks about this in such an amazing way in Romans. He says to his listeners, I want you to really catch this because this is powerful. In chapter 12, verse number 18, he says, as much as it's possible, I want you to live in peace with everybody, period. That's actually exactly how it's rendered in the Greek. As much as it's possible. What is it that Paul recognizes that Jesus taught? That when it comes to reconciliation, you and I should, what is that? It's just the joining back, right? We should pursue that. And it should be our desire, but it doesn't always happen. Why? Because it takes two for reconciliation to happen. You might be fully surrendered and you might be trying to pursue that broken relationship. You might be trying to mend that hurt and that argument with that coworker. You might be trying to mend the brokenness between you and your spouse. You might be trying, like all of the things that right now the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart because I believe he's speaking to all of us right now. Places we have anger, a person, 10 people, half the country. What is it? As much as we can, we need to be reconciled, but it takes two to reconcile. So if you and I are battling it out and your heart is good and my heart is not good, you did your part because I didn't do my part. But the only thing that's required always from Genesis to Revelation is forgiveness. We have to seek peace. And if nothing else, there's got to be forgiveness. We've got to let it go. By the way, in the next chapter, Jesus is going to do something in this same sermon that still today blows me away. He says one sentence that I have a hard time grappling with. In fact, most preachers will never preach about it because it's too hard theologically. And he says this. You're going to see it if you study it in the next chapter. By the way, if you don't forgive your brother and sister, your heavenly Father will not do what? Maybe you heard that for the first time right now. 
because nobody talks about it. That's how serious it is for Jesus. So he says, look, with your brothers and sisters in Christ, he was talking to the nation of Israel, with those that you love, that love God, be reconciled as much as it's possible. Don't let there be anger in your heart. Do not speak ill will. Don't be ugly like the four grown children were to each other. Love each other. And then you're thinking, I, I can do that. I'm, I'm at peace right now. The people in this room, I'm in peace. We're all good. Life is great. Now, maybe not my boss, maybe not the neighbor, but Jesus has one more thing to tell us. Let's look at those last two verses. Maybe you caught it. He talks about being taken to court. And if that happens, to settle matters quickly when you are on the way. Important phrase. One of the things that's challenging about this particular passage is it's hard for pastors to interpret it and apply it because they, they, they're kind of misreading it a little bit. Like, oh, this, is, this has to do with court. So like, if you are brought to court, this is what you do. It's a misunderstanding because 999 of us aren't ever going to be in court and under this kind of situation where we're thrown in prison for a debt, right? There's something that we don't get that they got. It's a concept. There's a Hebrew word that in this case, Jesus speaks in the Aramaic, and I want you to really catch this. That phrase, along the way, some of your translations might say on the way, is a really important word. In Aramaic, it's hadas, and it's translated highway. But metaphorically, how the audience heard it, the way it was always used, is this way. Fascinating research you can do on Hadass. It's a metaphor to mean the circle of your everyday living, the path that you are on in the everyday life. The Hadass of your life is the comings and goings outside of the temple. <laughs> it's the comings and goings outside of this church. It is your gym. It is your workplace. It is the community around you. It's people that don't believe like you. Jesus is doing something brilliant because he's the son of God and he is the truth. He is making sure that none of us are off the hook right now. This issue of not even being angry is for our brothers and sisters in Christ, and it's also for your neighbor that you really can't stand. It's also for that person at the gym that always gives you the same scowling face. It's also for the boss, or the fill in the blank, people outside in the community, the world we're supposed to reach. He says, just so you know, this principle that I just shared in the beginning, it is true in the body of Christ, and it's true on the way of life. All those things to the outside. So here we go, if there's one thing that I am as a teacher, it is this. If we are hearers of this word, don't come back. Come back because I love you and I want you to be here and I know the pastors do, but what is the point of his word? Well, we, we, we have to believe in God. Well, James says that the demons do that. Well, we have to know the truth. That they have it memorized. None of us in this room have it memorized. They have it memorized. Satan quoted it right back in Jesus' face. Like, if Christianity is a head knowledge, just pack your bags. Let's go to Florida. Do it again. Like, we have to be hearers but doers of it. Amen? So if there's one thing that I have to do, how do I live this out in my life? Because in a few moments, when we sing this song again, run to the Father, oh my goodness, I was a teary mess. We're going to do it again, and I'm going to be at this altar. Can I tell you why? If you think that I'm there to show you all, like this is how you go to the altar, no, I've got a lot of people I'm angry at right now. I'm living this out. When I wrote this message a few days ago, I didn't finish the job. I, I've got to work this out. We've got to be doers of it. So here's what I sense the Lord is speaking right now. We live in a culture. I'm a student of culture. One of my graduate degrees is in apologetics, and there's one thing in our culture that I'm terrified will unravel everything in our country, and that is a false belief that goes like this. You only love me if you agree with me. If you and I don't agree, you hate me. Call me a liar. Is that not the most pervasive thing right now in our country, that you only care about me if you agree? C can I just tell you? On a principle level, a logical truth level, it's a fallacy. It, 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 
We know it can't work. Take parents, for example. If my kid said, I know that I slapped my sister and I know I lied to you, but you, you're going to love me if you just don't say anything. This is what I wanted to do. Show me a parent that would be like, you know what, I do love you. I agree with you. <laughs> no. Get your butt upstairs. Well, Pastor, my neighbors aren't my kids. I mean, I... Well, okay. Let's do it that way too. I can only work with you if we agree. I can only be friends if you think just like me. It's going to unravel our country. Because this word right here is offensive to me. It says things I don't always want to hear. I don't say, well, because you don't say, Bible, what I want to hear, I'm done. <laughs> God speaks to my heart all the time. Can I just tell you some things? Most of the stuff that I sense the Holy Spirit saying, I'm not going hip, hip, hooray about. I'm going, Ugh. you're right. I need to set, I surrender that, yeah? So this has got to end in our culture, and I want to give you the secret for it. It's always a spiritual problem. The body of Christ is called to speak the truth in love. What is the opposite of hate? It's love. Not agreement, it's love. It is way more powerful to love somebody. Okay, we gotta have a moment right here because I've been praying that the Holy Spirit has already got people on your heart and mind. I know he does and he's got it on mine. Here's the moment. Love is only powerful, really powerful, when you love people that disagree with you. When you can say, it's okay to agree to disagree, but I still love you. Okay, this is the, the truth in Brian moment. My wife and I, if there's one thing we're known for in our teaching, we're super raw. Like, we just share it, okay? So can I just do that? We're here on this candidating weekend, super spiritual, powerful meetings, Jesus, Holy Spirit, Jason, everybody, it's nuts. And two nights ago, we had a fight in our hotel room. Just, you know, with we're going through a lot, thinking about all these things, all good, and had an argument, and it actually started in the car coming up. We fought. Is that okay? I'm sorry. I, pastors are not supposed to fight. I got it. We do, because we're just human. And it lasted. I mean, it was like five minutes. Nope, five hours. Maybe the better part of 12 hours. But I just want to tell you, we love Jesus. That's not the secret sauce. I'm just telling you that as I'm sitting there in anger, the Lord is speaking to me and he's saying, yeah, you're teaching about anger. That's good for you, Brian. And I know my wife because she's in the word constantly. And we just found peace together. It was amazing. Is that okay? Can I, can I just share that? So like when, when Jesus says, don't even be angry, it's because this is the antidote to our culture and any culture that's ever lived. Love wins, especially in the face of, I don't agree with you, or I may not even like your choices or your decisions, but I choose to love you. Why? Because Jesus Christ loved me in my sin and my shame. I know you've heard that the church is the hope of the world, and I believe that, but I believe one thing deeper than that. I believe that Christ in you is the hope of the world. Because people will argue with your theology. They'll argue with your politics. They'll argue even with your testimony. Eh, I don't believe it. But I found something that no one can argue with. Straight up in your face, I love you. And I know you disagree. I love you anyway, I'm gonna show it, right? Jesus, look, these teachings, this is serious stuff. <laughs> like This is radical level teaching. It's so simple that it's hard to do. So the Spirit spoke to my heart. This is how I want to end. He told me that I feel like there's three people in this room. I believe in responding. And I think that for some, there's just a forgiveness issue. You know it right now. There is somebody that you have got to forgive. Or even bigger, maybe you need to go and say, please forgive me. One of the most powerful moments I ever saw in a church service was when a woman got up in the middle of a service, walked over here, standing room only, and I'm preaching, and I mean, it's like, good. It's, it's mediocre, but it was solid. And I'm literally like, what, 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 what is going on? And they just embrace, and it is a snot fest. They start crying. I can barely make it out. They, they literally practice this. Stop the worship. Stop the altar. Pastor Brian, this is great preaching, but I'm going to live this out. I hate her, and we had a fight years ago, and we're taking care of it right now, and that's the gospel like I've never seen it before. The whole church stood up and started clapping, and I'm like, 
Sermon closed. Let's head to the altar. Like, this is what we got to do, right? I'm going to be here. When the Spirit speaks to your heart in a moment, don't just take care of business there. You can. But man, God is inspired when we get up and say, I'm running to the altar. I'm running back to you. I, I want to set this down. So that's one. Some of us need to forgive somebody. I hope you do it today. And if they're not close by, then send a letter or a text. If they're close enough, then go to coffee. Because your father, Jesus Christ said, don't even be angry. The second group are those that are really dealing with some anger. But you know that you can't and you know that you shouldn't. And today is a moment to stand up and say, I just recognize my heart's beating out of my chest today. I don't know who this joker is, but like that just tugged at me and like I've got some anger issues and I want to set them down and I'm going to be there too. But here's the third and that is that you really are angry, like really angry and you're just not sure you can let it go. You run to Jesus and he'll say, I know, but I can help you do this, yeah? Would you close your eyes with me? Nothing magical about it. I just want you to be so focused, not distracted. I don't go through a big, you know, kind of song and dance because I, I, the Spirit doesn't need that. Like, if you, this morning, just lock in for a moment, let Him speak to you. You're dealing with some forgiveness or you need to seek forgiveness and you know it and you can feel it in your heart. Or maybe you've got some anger, but you want to set it down. Like you understand, man, I haven't been treating my neighbor right. I haven't been treating my boss right. I haven't been, my friend, my sister. You're ready to do it. Or three, the anger hurts bad and you're not sure how to get past it. If you are all three or one of them, I want you to put your hand up in the air to recognize, Jesus, I heard you right now. One, two, three. One of those three spoke to you. Hands literally everywhere. Put them down for a moment. Jesus. God, I thank you for your truth and for your word. If there is one syllable I spoke that is not of you, let it be forgotten right now. But only let the things that are truth be remembered. God, I pray that you would help us in forgiveness, that you would help us set down that anger. Some of us, just it's just an action step. We just need to go. We gotta write that letter. We need to have that text. We need to run across that room right now. Whatever it is, God, I pray that we would do it because when the world sees that even if we disagree, I can love, your word says they will know, this community, this county will know that they are my disciples because River Tree loves. Or maybe it's just hard and you don't know if you can. The team is about to lead us in this song. We're going to stand. In fact, I want you to do that right now, right where you're at. And as we begin to sing this song, make it real because my prayer is not powerful. It's your prayer that's powerful. And I just want to encourage you, if you raised your hand or even if you didn't, and you know this is real, just make your way down for a few moments. Let it set it down together.